Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 390. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Willing is not enough. We must do. Bruce Lee. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble and quarantined host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films. From predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them, the odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. Today's show is also sponsored by DaVinci Resolve 16. Blackmagic Design's DaVinci Resolve is the world's only solution that combines professional 8K editing, color correction, visual effects, and audio production all in one software tool. I've been using DaVinci Resolve for years and has been my main editing and color grading solution, and basically online uh, post-production solution now for probably five to six years. I can't recommend it enough. It is now available for free download from Blackmagic Design's website at www.blackmagicdesign.com. And if you want the full studio version, it is only $2.99. So head over to blackmagicdesign.com. Before we get started, guys, I set up a special link to help people affected by the coronavirus, and you can donate to Feed America. There is a lot of people in need out there, and Feed America is a great organization, and they're helping millions of people on a daily basis, and they also need your help. If you want to donate even five bucks, ten bucks, it goes a long way. Head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash help. Now, guys, I am excited to bring this episode to you today. On the show, we have Stephen Lewis Simpson. And Stephen is a filmmaker who is able to self-distribute his film and make hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of the last four or five years and never released it online. It is strictly theatrical only. And he didn't just do it in the U.S. He has done it throughout the world all single-handedly. And this episode is just plumb filled with knowledge bombs left and right. I was first introduced to Stephen by his TED Talk that I saw online. And after I saw it, I was like, I got to get into this. I got to reach out to him. And I did. And Stephen was gracious enough to be on the show and spill all the beans on how he has been able to have a basically a very sustainable and successful theatrical distribution company where he basically just does his own movie. And he did it. He wasn't a distributor before he did it, but now he's helping other filmmakers self-distribute their films theatrically as well. Now, I know in the current world that we live in, theatrical doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the whole world is kind of shut down and we don't know how long it's going to last. But the lessons that you're going to learn in this episode, you can apply to other areas of your distribution plan and when this does eventually pass, you can be in a much better position to take advantage of the new opportunities because there might be less studio films in the theatrical space and they might be wanting more independent content. So this episode is mandatory for all filmmakers and film entrepreneurs in the IFH tribe. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Stephen Lewis Simpson. I'd like to welcome to the show Stephen Lewis Simpson, man. How are you doing, my friend? Very well, thanks. And you? Very good, man. Thank you so much for being on the show. You have a very unique 
distribution story. You have a unique film, and we're I wanted to get into the weeds with you about it because it is a uh, it, you're doing things that arguably shouldn't be done, uh, as they say, and shouldn't work, as they say. It's, it's traditional thoughts uh, occur in the industry. So that's why I want to kind of, I always love bringing people who break the rules and then show you how they broke the rules and how it could apply to your films. But before we get into it, how did you get into the business in the first place? Oh, well, I mean, I grew up in a, a town in Aberdeen, Scotland, which, um, you know, nobody had ever made a movie there before from there. Right. And uh, when I was about 17, I picked up a camera, started shooting things, became interested in the business. But there was no platform. So um, I became, well, I ended up being the, the youngest fully qualified stockbroker and trader in the UK and did that for a little while and shot things off in in between on the side, set up this film group and uh, wrote scripts and stuff. And then when I was 22, uh, a chance phone call uh, led me to sort of giving that all up, jumping on a plane, moving to LA and uh, working at, for six months at Roger Corman's studio, oh. which was the only place in the world I wanted to start. Obviously, absolutely. That must, oh man, yeah. you got to tell me some Roger stories because that must have been a hell of a film school. <laughs> it Well, it was, but this was actually, I think in a way, I mean, the classic era was the 60s, 70s, late 50s in many ways. But uh, since then, I mean, he just got more prolific, but the video we aged just crappier films, but but I was there during the time of Carnosaur and the Fantastic Four. Oh, you the, were there the, when they shot. Oh, that. yeah, I was there. I was there when they were casting and all the way through. For, um, for everyone yeah. listening, for everyone listening who doesn't uh, is not aware of this, Roger Corman, the world famous legendary film producer, out of th- hundreds, if not thousands, of films that he has created. Fantastic Four was the only film he never released. I think it was. It was if I'm if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah, but it was made never to be released. Right, because it was like they had the rights. Marvel sold the rights off, and they had to make it. If not, they would lose the rights. So they like, quickly made it, it. Roger, yeah, it was basically this. Uh, Sw- I think it was Swiss Ger- or Swiss German company had the rights, and yeah. they were going to lapse by 31st December, and so unless they were in production. And so Roger's production started, I think it was either 27th or 29th of December. <laughs> oh, Jesus. And then from my understanding, they actually – the movie was finished, give or take. Oh, yeah. It was yeah, finished. It, it, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It, whether it's you a, just don't want to see any part of it. <laughs> exactly. So when uh, I think Marvel saw it or one of the – I think it was Avi Lerner or one of those producers saw it. They're like, look, we're just going to buy this so you never release it. And that's what the documentary hey, I, said. It, well, it sort of does, but I, and there's actually a picture of me in the doc, which is kind of cute. But there's, um, the, the, it's interesting watching the doc because my memory of it is from the beginning, we all just assumed it was made to be shelved. It was purely for securing the rights. And, you know, it was never in, I think, in his domain ever to have any of the distribution rights or whatever. They just gave him a flat fee to do it, a nice little profit for him. And then, this is the classic Roger thing. Uh, he went down to the studio this particular Thursday as they were winding up the shoot. The sets were, shall we say, somewhat better than usual. You know, somewhat, somewhat. But more importantly, somebody else had paid for them. And so uh, he came back into the office on a Friday and he said, OK, we got an eight day window coming up in the studio. So we're going to make another movie with these same sets. Over Saturday and a Sunday, they rewrote a kickboxing movie, set it in space. I mean, not not weightless space. I hasten to point out, obviously, that wouldn't be much of a kickboxing. False gravity, <laughs> F- false yeah. gravity. Obviously, oh, I, I could. I would argue that the, uh, the the weightless kickboxing movie would be very interesting to watch. <laughs> it, it it would be unique, perhaps. But so so Saturday, Sunday, they rewrote the script. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they cast, and then that Thursday, they were shooting. I mean, literally from a Thursday through to the following Thursday, an idea strikes his head and they're shooting. Um, I was an apprentice editor on that film and it was, you know, it was worse than the Fantastic Four. <laughs> that's, and that's saying a lot. And that's saying something. But he made some money with it, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is for sure. <laughs> okay. And, so- and, and, the, and the, well, the tragedy for him in a way was that, you know, this was all being shot on 35 mil. I mean, imagine today he's just – you know, oh. churning this stuff out and putting on a hard drive and 
not having to edit on film and all those sorts of things. He can move much quicker. Um, all right. So now, so you went through the, the school of hard knocks with Roger and, uh, were part of one of the, the worst, uh, arguably the worst Marvel movie. And that's saying something because there was Captain America. There was Thor and Hulk. There was Daredevil and Hulk. Uh, in the seventies, these are, these are bad films. I don't want to go down the Marvel road because we'll talk for an hour on that alone. But after you're done with hard knocks of, uh, Roger Corman's film school, where did you go from there? I immediately returned to Scotland and shot my first feature when I was 23. Um, I had some of the crew came over from LA, uh, people that some of them I met at Corman and some others had just met people through Corman's operation there. And so, yeah, I shot that when I was 23, um, you know, back in the day where, you know, it was much harder because you had to do everything on film and so on. And then the following year, it premiered at the Edinburgh International Film Festival. And the UK was a barren wasteland of filmmaking at the time, particularly um, micro budget. And, you know, my fi- I was the only Scottish filmmaker that year to make a movie, you know, at five million people. Um, you know, that's how, how bare it was. The only other film to go into production at the same time was Shallow Grave. It started mm-hmm. shooting a week after mine, which was Danny Boyle's debut. Yeah. Which but, is, by the way, if you have not seen the Shallow Grave, everyone should go out and watch Shallow Grave. It's an amazing, amazing film. So, all right. So tell me, how did you get involved with, uh, neither Wolf nor Dog? Tell me a little bit about that film. Well, I, uh, 20 years ago, I found myself out on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and um, some remarkable things happened and I ended up starting filming um, a feature documentary there. The first person to ask me to film there was Russell Means, who was a um, legendary activist of the 20th century of the Native American cause, um, probably the most famous activist since Sitting Bull. And uh, he became an actor years later, third lead in Last of the Mohicans was his first acting role. And... Um, he asked me to film things there and that snowballed into a feature documentary I made over 13 years about the reservation. Also made another movie there called Res Bomb, which was a love story thriller. And, um, a number of years ago, maybe 11 years ago, I was showing that in a theater near the reservation. And this author approached me with his novel, neither wolf nor dog told me people in Hollywood have been circling it for, you know, since the mid nineties, he kept getting these grand promises you know, that one Hollywood producer had developed a script out of it, spent quite a lot of money, development money on it, but they never managed to push it across the line. And he was just getting really fed up. And he thought, well, here's somebody that actually gets things made and tonally knows how to make things from the reservation out rather than sort of Hollywood in, which is the biggest flaw with, you know, I mean, nobody's been depicted worse in cinema history than natives <laughs> over a hundred years, you know, yeah. pro-gen- pro-genocide cinema for a hundred years. And, um, And so he thought, well, hell, let's see if this guy's nuts enough to do this. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to get around to looking at it. And then just almost nine years ago, I gave him a promise I'd get it made by by any means necessary. And, you know, as any independent filmmaker knows, you know, it is by any means necessary. But this one has gone that much further because, you know, normally you make a film by any means necessary. Then you throw it out there. You do a few festivals whatever else. And then it just evaporates like 90 odd percent out of the, you know, the, I mean, what is it? Something like 5,000 features, a, you know, features a year submitted to Sundance. No, it was actually um, a total, a total list last year was 15,000 between shorts and features. Yeah. Between shorts and features. Yeah. And yeah. then something like 20, 20,000 features a year in the world, between, Period, yeah. you know, everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, you look at, um, you even look at Sundance, for example, and you see how many end up there and how, few of them end up doing really any business in cinemas and that's the selected few. Yeah. That's the Mecca. Yeah. Right. And then, so if you break down to 20,000, you know, maybe 550, 650 films end up in theaters within the United States. The first 200 or so are, are blocked off by the studios and those other big releases. And then you've got a few prestige major titles like out of the UK and whatever else. And then, you know, you've got two, 300 films that are free for all about 200 of them, We'll do almost no business, but it's just getting a marquee thing. So you're basically, um, you know, normally you're just making a film and then kissing it goodbye. And in this case, I knew that wasn't an option. 
So before, and, so let me interrupt you. Before we get into the whole distribution, because we're going to go deep into that, how was the production of this? Because you know, I want I want people to understand that this was not a forty man, forty woman crew um, <laughs> running around, uh, you know, with with um, sushi for lunch and lobster yeah. tail for dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, put it in perspective. Um, it would be hard pressed to find a more kind of you know, nuts way to make a film in, in a way, because we're, we're filming in what is the, the harshest area in the, in the country in terms of living conditions, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, 80 plus percent unemployment, life expectancy for men, 48, about 52 for women. Wow. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's really bleak conditions, but it's also somewhere I've got incredible relationships and uh, there's actually nowhere easier for me to film really because of the relationship I have with people there, but you're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, which has pros and cons. And, um, you know, I have a 95 year old star who's never been the lead in a film before he's been in and out of films and small roles before, but often as a stunt man when he was younger and, um, you know, but 95 year old memory, long passages of dialogue. I mean, it's not a, a good, you know, mix, um, plus an overweight Corgi in the mix and a 1973 Buick that didn't behave. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, we ended up filming this 110 minute long feature in about 125 filming hours, um, spread over about 18 days. You know, you got a 95 year old, you can only film so long in a day, but even then you're having to film very long. Um, you know, sometimes there was one key scene dialogue scene. We filmed perhaps three hours on him and then we turned around and then everything on the other characters from a single take and then you move on. Um, you know, and, you know, there's a lot of single, singular two take scenes within it. There was um, about a seven page scene, which is more or less a monologue where, you know, sun's coming down. Uh, the only day this actor, particular actor is going to be there. And um, it's a case of we shoot a wider shot and then a, a, a very wide and then a reasonably wide because the nature was a big part of this. And then we move on. So it was about seven pages from sticks down to sticks up in about twenty five minutes. Wow! And I and mean, it's so you yeah, didn't and wow. you didn't have a large crew. You had a, a few people. Average of two. Average of two, and that includes you, or in addition to you, sir. In addition to me, okay. I had a, <laughs> I had a, I had the most amazing uh, sound mixer. And I could tell from that trailer; it sounds amazing. Well, you got, you know, the thing is that you've, you know, you've got a 95 year old, you can't, you know, ADR and stuff like that's not an option. You, mm -hmm. you got to get what it is. Um, and, you know, my mantra is whatever stage of filmmaking you're in is the most important stage. The script is by far the most important thing while you're on the script. The edit is the most important thing while you're in the edit. Da, 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 da. Except when, particularly with micro, micro budget, it's, it's sound, it's sound, it's sound, it's sound, it's sound. It's always sound. Because the, that's the thing that if that fucks up, everything's gone. Mm -hmm. It's just that, that the house of cards just shatters. You can have other things that people will, you know, bend with you somewhat, you know, but the sound, forget about it. And was this, uh, was this self uh, financed or, and what was the, if you don't mind me asking, what was kind of the budget? If you don't want to say, just tell me. Well, I, I'm, I'm still not a hundred percent sure. Cause I haven't needed to add it up for anyone. Um, and, you know, you kind of – there's a certain point when you're going to post that's like, well, where are the lines? You know, it's kind of like, you know, because, I mean, I was living through it. and But, um, you know, I already had the computer. I already had yeah, whatever. Me too. Yeah. So the post was theoretically nothing, but at the same time I had to live through all, all that time. Um, I mean, it was – Kickstarter really covered the budget. Okay. Um, the, the shoot was with everyone paid, shooting on location – um, was probably around 25 grand. That's not bad at all. That's I mean, with everyone paid. That's with everyone you paid. Know, yeah. Paid, put up, fed, you know, all that stuff for 18 but, days you know, for 18 production days. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, it was like, you know, one of them was, uh, you know, flying them in from Canada was like a grand, you know, it's like, you're, there's a few things that are, you know, pain like that. But one of the things that makes a big difference, and this is one of the things I've, I've always done is I buy and sell the equipment and I actually made a profit on the equipment in this film. There was, interesting. you know, you know I, um, if you have the cash set aside, mm -hmm. um, and I actually bought three vehicles as well. 
you know, I bought a, the 73 Buick, I bought a 86 pickup truck and I bought a 26 foot RV. And, um, you want to know a surefire way of making good money? Mm -hmm. Buy an RV in Rapid City or somewhere around there in the middle of November, uh, middle of October, because nobody's buying an RV till May. Mm -hmm. So it's a buyer's market mm -hmm. and you can get an amazing price. Right. Again, and then sell it in LA in May, just before, just before Burning Man. <laughs> That's right. You're absolutely yep. right. Yeah. 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 Cause every, every, you know, who is going to be needing an RV. So, um, That's funny. And I, you make a profit. I bought, I bought, well, I bought this RV for 3,800 and it was in nice condition. I sold it for nine grand. <laughs> So you you did a little arbi arbitrage getting, arbitrage. He thought on he this. was getting a yeah. He thought he was getting a deal because he got me down from nine and a half. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is a film entrepreneur right there, my friend. That is a hustler. I like it. I like it. And you do the so, same thing with the gear as well. Pretty much. I mean, I I lost a little bit on. I, I shot with a red one. Sure. And um, I lost a little bit on that because I held on to it for quite a while. And um, but I I bought the steady cam. Had it shipped from China. Rented it a little bit afterwards, made a profit on it. Um, same with a lot of my lighting and, and other so a few other pieces of kit. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, I, I, the, one of the other cars I made a bit of money on, one of them I lost a little bit. But, you know, overall. Overall, yeah, you were profitable on, yeah. Rent, oh, yeah. on buying your cars, your gear, and then reselling yeah. them back afterwards. You were in yeah, profit. Yeah. So mm, basically mm. you got all of that for free to use for your film. Yeah. And yeah. then, and but then I, you made a little cash. Yeah. And I just, but I, I fronted that all myself. That Correct. was separate to the sort of Kickstarter money. And it was, you know, if, 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 you know, I mean, I always had some kit staying, you know, I mean, it, it's always that thing, things like mic speakers and lenses you hold on to sure. cameras you get rid of because yeah. next year there's something better. Right, exactly. And there's always someone who's willing to buy. Like you shot with the Red One. I mean, I, I've shot with I shot with the Red One back in uh, 2010, 2011, mm -hmm. which was the early days of the Red One when no one understood mm -hmm. the workflow. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I was a little naive, shall we say? I got it. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was sent to Red before you know, the purchaser. In between, it went to Red for servicing, just so that I made sure I got it correctly. And they spent quite a while with it, so it landed in my hands just before going out there, and that was unfortunate because I. Yeah, I was a little naive. Yeah, um, you should have had a couple of days I, of testing for that. Yeah, I mean, so I made a couple of errors, and there's a little CGI to tidy it up. <laughs> fix it in post. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> fix it in post. Yeah, yeah. And actually, one of the things that I've done a fair bit of, um, and it, it's sort of, I mean, I think Gareth Edwards probably took this further than anyone with Monsters, um, is doing a lot of art direction in post. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we filmed, there was, I think three buildings where I changed the signposts, for example, in post, yeah, you first, know, yeah. just to change the locations and whatever else. And that's actually quite easy. And, and just the whole process of shooting as fast as you can, and then spending as long tweaking those things in post. That's, that's the great fix it in post part as opposed to, oh my God, the sound is crap. How are we going to sort this out? Kind right. of thing, oh, which I, I mean, but that's getting better and better. I had a scene where we were filming. We were sort of stealing a shot in a real gas station, which was really busy when we were filming. I was shooting from inside the RV, and the characters are all radioed up. And suddenly this car alarm kicks in uh, through this scene. And I'm going, and then, you know, it's sort of one of these things where we're done. We've got to move on, single take. And then it's like, I don't know if this scene's ever going to work. How am I going to fix it? And yet... Nowadays, the software is so incredible. I literally managed to move the, remove the car alarm, and I, I never even know it was there when I hear it bang. I, I, shot a, I shot a movie that was a lot live on location as well, and there was like some construction. We walked right by a construction site while it was going off, and there was banging and clanging. And I'm like, and the, we were all wired up. We were all radioed up as well. So, but you know, it, it was an issue. And I literally saw my genius sound designer at the in post open up the wave, and then he can pinpoint the vibrate yeah. the, the 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 octave and just delete all of those octaves and it yeah. you barely hear it now where it was a huge it, clang now it's nothing it was insane yeah it it's like taking an eraser to it isn't it and just going <laughs> and going that's a little bit and okay just rub it out it's it, it really is it's pretty remarkable amazing. yeah it, we're we're 
I mean, I, it's funny. I, 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 a few months ago, I gave a couple of lectures at a, a film school in L.A. And one of the, what I, how I started one of them was I said, you know, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. <laughs> oh, that's a, I'm going to steal that because that is great. Yeah, because in the film business, it truly is. I mean, in terms of technology, it's incredible for all these things that we can do, particularly on the micro budget. Uh, but the problem is where it's the worst of times when I made my first feature, which I think is my weakest. Mm-hmm. Um, I had three screenings for Miramax. Um, you know, I managed to get somebody at Columbia Studios, an executive phoning me up in Aberdeen, Scotland, asking to see it. Um, it was easy to get attention from agents and whatever else because nobody was doing it. You know, it was like there was a handful of us. Mm-hmm. This was like the year after Mariachi came out. Mm-hmm. And so even though it was, and it was because it was so much harder. And, and in those days, executives used to spend time trying to figure out where the new talent was. Now they're just leaving it all up to a different set of gatekeepers, uh, festivals, and whatever else. And even then it's all still so personality based and whatever else it's, I mean, it's, it's, a very, very, very screwed up industry for sure. No question. And it's changing more and more. It's just changing so rapidly that people can't even keep up. Uh, mm-hmm. and I always tell people that as well, the filmmakers, uh, it's the, it, it is the best and the worst of times because it's like anyone can make a movie and that's the good news. The bad news is anyone can make a movie. And, and that's, that's the, that's the problem because you know, the competition is so fierce. I, I always tell people like in the eighties, all you needed to do was make a movie and it was sold. It could be the worst movie ever. Mm-hmm. Toxic Avenger got a theatrical release. I mean, mm-hmm. anything could get done. And now well, it, it's tough. It, it's true. I, I think the thing that hasn't changed so much is, you know, back in the eighties and nineties and whatever else, anyone could write a feature script. Mm hmm. There was nothing holding anyone back from writing a feature script, although in the days of the typewriter, it was more of a pain for sure. <laughs> right. And that's – I go that far back. And um, second draft, oh god. Um, but the thing about it is you know, you've always had that. You've always had the people committed enough to write a screenplay. So I think that even though the number of films being made might have gone up a 100 times if you're including – Jim, Bob, and Cedric going and running around the woods with their, their iPhone. Um, the difference is that you, you, know, you still got roughly the same number of people sitting down and writing a proper film script. Mm-hmm. And so I think that what's not really changing is the number of good scripts being written. Um, and in a way, I wonder whether the way into the industry proper uh, isn't so much you know going and just making that pretty much crappy film that everyone else is making, Mm -hmm. but it's still that people are looking for something that actually just really works on the page. Although again, the problem is that we're in the industry. Are they looking for quality writing these days? And actually, well, it's television. It's not, it's not the film business, certainly in the United States In, in Europe, it's a little different and, and whatever else, but, it's committee driven more in Europe, which sucks in a different way. <laughs> right. Exactly. There's, yeah. We all got all levels of crazy we have to deal with or around the world, depending on well, the, 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 the thing I find more objectionable in Europe is that, you know, because there's much more government funding for film, it's like you're allowed to make art, mm-hmm. but they don't. You know, it's like you, you have this greater freedom and yet the committees and everything else, they get in the way, which is much more objectionable to me than somebody going – well, you made something for a, a, a company with a hundred and fifty billion dollar volume, and they need you to do this because you know they want something to fit on this shelf and not that shelf. Well, that to me is more honorable than here you have creative freedom and you still turned out a piece of crap. <laughs> you know that to me is, yep. is you know better. sad. It's sad. It's sad. Yeah. Sorry. So you finish this, this film, and now what is your experience in the distribution realm? Like, did you? from the very beginning decide to do self distribution did you go down the traditional road and just say this is not for me what was your plan with this one you know i've been in the business long enough not to take the industry seriously in terms of you know integrity or or you know looking at things in in too great a detail but in because i had particularly my 95 year old star give a very committed performance and my other stars be very committed to it. And also in a sense, kind of pandering to the desires of the author, I thought, well, I'll, I'll really try to get it a great platform. Um, I thought more than any film I've ever made, this is the one that's got a chance of 
getting a big festival and all that sort of thing. Um, and as it turned out, the highlight of my festival run with this film was actually uh, screening it just for the select for the, for the head of the Venice Film Festival personally in a screening room of L.A. And he ended up passing on it very late on. But he was so gracious in how the whole thing was handled and turning it down. Being turned down by the Venice Film Festival was the highlight of my <laughs> festival career with this. You know, we ended up playing a few festivals, some OK festivals and whatever else, a couple of nice ones in Germany and whatnot. But it, I've, I've never been knocked back more by festivals than this film. And this is my most festival friendly film. That's my most culturally important film. And it is this thing where, you know, I mean, festivals are as much about personalities and connections and whatever else as, 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 as anything else. And, um, and, you know, there's a certain point where I just thought, well, this is a complete waste of time. But I, I should have just walked straight past that. I should have just gone straight out to my own form of distribution. And, and along the way, you know, I'm, I'm messaging the usual players, you know, Synetic and, um, uh, CAA and all these folks and they're like great let us see it we'll you know this sounds interesting let us see it beautiful thing about Vimeo is and I I set up private individual links for everyone uh, a little controlling perhaps but um, so that I can see who watched it yeah and none of them bothered even watching it and so you're like it's not like I got knocked back so they just never got around to it and you, there's just a certain point where you go, okay, well, fuck that, on to the next thing. And um, and so I thought, okay, now I'm just going to see what I can do getting it out into theaters. And my strategy was very simple from the beginning, which was I want to be a big fish in a small pond, not a minnow in an ocean. And I knew where this work would be, excuse me, well received. And so, I mean, the first ever showing I did theatrically was in this tiny little theater on the reservation I filmed in. And that was just very, very simply because they're so tired of people coming filming there and never being heard from again. And my relationship there is too precious to me and they always get it first. That's just my golden rule. Um, and then a few weeks later, I released it in four theaters uh, conventionally, Friday openings for a week. Uh, one of them was in Bemidji, Minnesota, in a multiplex, 10-screen multiplex. Uh, the novel was written there and well-known there. Uh, Rochester, New York, also multiplex. Just convinced them to take it. Uh, a two-screen on a reservation where my elder was from. Now, and on his, uh, I don't mean to interrupt you. Are these bookings or are you four-walling? No, bookings, 100% bookings. Okay. And, 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 and until I get to L.A., every single thing I'm talking about is a straight booking. Ali, I've only I've only four walled one of six hundred venues, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then the, the fourth was this uh, little uh, museum cinema, but full run cinema in one screener on this Yakima Nation uh, in Washington State, where ironically my white lead was born. My my white lead in this film was the only white guy I've ever heard to be born in an Indian Health Service hospital on a reservation. It was just pure random stuff, and. Um, we ended up averaging that first week about a four and a half grand screen average. That's insane. Uh, well, what's the, what's yeah. the split? What's the split with the theater? 50, 50. Split. And that was the average. And you got to bear in mind that some of these places, it's like $6 tickets and they're in the middle of nowhere. Um, in Bemidji, we did, I think about nine grand the first week. We ended up with 1600 admissions over two weeks, uh, from a town of 15, thousand people but are so you are 10. you are you marketing yeah you're marketing so what's the kind of marketing that you're doing in these towns uh hi is that the bemidji reporter uh my name's steve simpson did you get my press release i got a film opening there blah 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 sure okay do an interview get a feature big feature uh, big fish small pond yeah exactly exactly and um so yeah in bemidji that first week we were the number one film we beat the nine hollywood films in there and from then on, it was a slow building process. Uh, it got easier to book venues in those areas. And uh, it sort of slowly started to build. By April, I said I had enough coming in that I, I brought somebody in to help me, uh, who had no experience, but just somebody who, who sounded interesting, uh, interested in it and, and uh, is still with me today, booking venues and handling my media out of L.A. Um, 
And then we had in the third week in May, we had, well, actually in, in, in April, we had a significant development, which is Marcus Theatres that are one of the bigger chains in the country, booked us into a few of their theatres. And we ran in one of them for four weeks. I mean, it wasn't huge numbers we did, but, you know, four weeks in a multiplex is pretty good. And then we opened in uh, mid-May in uh, Minneapolis, Denver, um, Tacoma, Washington, and uh, Lincoln, uh, Nebraska. God, I mean, the memory of all this. But in in Minnesota, it was at one of the landmark theaters uh, chain there. And... It was phenomenal. I mean, literally, the manager, one of the managers was reaching out to me with, uh, this is the first film to sell out a whole bunch of showings since the previous Star Wars movie. Um, we did as many admissions in our first week, uh, sorry, more admissions in our first week than the film with the top screen average in the entire United States that week, which was also in one screen, uh, but it was in New York, and on, also in one of the landmark screens, but their ticket price was like 60, 70% higher, hence them having a higher uh, numbers, uh, financial total, but we had way more admissions. We ended up with three and a half thousand admissions in that one cinema. Wow. I mean, we actually grossed, I mean, the ticket price, I mean, if it was a New York ticket price, we'd have been walking away with a 50 grand gross from that one theater. Now, so what is the actual, so for, for the listeners to understand, what is the process of doing this? So are you literally calling up the theaters and going, hey, I've got this movie about Native Americans. It's based on a novel. Do you send over a Vimeo link, and do you want to book it? How does that work? What's the process? Almost none of them watch it. Really? Almost none of them. Um, so in just, the U.S. – well, in the U.S., we've been in probably 230, 40 full-run cinemas in terms of anything, averaging maybe two weeks. 11 weeks is our longest in a single cinema. Mm-hmm. Um, Landmark looked at it as you'd expect. Um, I can't remember. Marcus, I, I don't, Marcus might have. I think Marcus might have. So you're telling but, me that most of these, these theaters don't even look to just like, oh, you have a movie and you want to split 50-50? They look, 50? At, they they look, at, the look at the trailer. Yeah, but, but the thing is, the beauty of it is, cinemas to me are the greatest meritocracy in the film business. Okay. And, and it's almost like this thing about, you know, the, um, the, the Eddie Murphy movie out on Netflix about the, the 70s. I love yeah. that movie. Love Dolomite. You, you, well, it was, but to me, when it got to the end and it was about his theatrical release and then suddenly it kicks in, I suddenly became immensely emotional because I completely understood. You know, it was like, oh, my God, kindred spirit there. But it was that thing that they didn't give a damn about his film. They gave a damn about the numbers. Of course. And, and that's where it is the great meritocracy. Um, the two things that first two things a sales agent or distributor principally, particularly sales agents ask you when you're putting a film together or, or want them to see a finished product is who's in it and what's it won. You know, the two questions pretty much I've never been asked by cinema. They don't get, never get asked who's in it. Um, is it, be- I, is it because given- I don't mean to interrupt you again, I'm sorry, but cause I'm fascinated by this and I'm just trying to understand the business model of the movie theater. Is it because they have a steady run of people running in? So they have customers coming to the theater regardless. And a lot of people in those smaller towns would just go to the theater and see what's playing. No, it's because I've already proven it. Okay. So you're already in that numbers game. Now, the one in Bemidji, they took the risk because they're like, okay, this was written locally. It's a, it's a best-selling novel. Okay, we can understand how this will do well. The two other reservations, they're going, this film stars people from here. Okay, that's an easy sell. Mm-hmm. From then on, the fact our numbers were better than people expected. And then it builds and builds from there. And... Then you start getting to tipping points in certain areas. Now, Minnesota is semi-understandable why it was so big. The novel was well-known, that sort of thing. And yet, a few weeks after that in Vancouver, Washington, this amazing one-screen theater, 337 seats or something, Kiggins Theater, they booked the film in, um, give it a handful of shows, six six shows the first week. Um, We do so well down the road, 10, 11 screen multiplex in the height of the summer blockbuster season, only Wonder Woman did better than we did that week. And they had 35 shows. We had six. And we end up being their second, second best performing film of the year off about 11 showings. The first, 
was a film starring Sam Elliott, who was born there. And so had a vested interest in the, with the audience. We even came back there on, about two years later and did about the same number of admissions from about a third of the shows. I mean, we did, you know, from about, I don't know, I think we maybe had 13, you know, maybe about 18 shows in this place and we did about 11 grand. Um, amazing. And so suddenly other theaters in the area are like, okay, we'll book it. And we've played something like nine theaters just within 20, 30 minutes of Portland and Vancouver. Because uh, word gets around. Yeah, yeah. And and it builds. And then, you know, in, in Washington State, we've been in almost 30 theaters. In, in Oregon, we've been in about 22. If you add it today from Minnesota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, Oregon, and Washington, this makes up less than 7% of the population in the U.S., but far a smaller percentage of the cinema market because the ticket prices are a lot lower, things like that. We've been in over 110 full-run cinemas. For a $25,000 movie about a Native yeah. American story. Yeah. There's not a single film from Fox Searchlight, Sony Picture Classics, or any of those guys that's been on anywhere near that. Uh, the writer actually shot on the exact same land as my movie. Uh, and I was actually – I bumped into Chloe uh, when she was shooting it because I was back out there. Um, and it was released by, by Sony, did – rather well and a massive critical claim it was maybe on 60 percent of the screens we were in within that region even though it, it also had the same local interest as mine in terms of that market but there's other parts of the u.s it's really hard to get into um there's other parts where we don't get a good audience um so you know we kind of feed more and more and more into where our our base is and i think that's the core thing for any film is to look at it and go where is our audience? But it's not just about booking the cinemas. Um, for example, there's a movie, Indian Horse, which played cinemas in the U.S. for about a year. It did really well in Canada, about $1.8 million in Canada. It was a Canadian native film. And Clint Eastwood exec produced it. They had an established company behind it, established Booker. And I met with the, the Booker, and we spoke about it. And he said uh, that his bosses were basically having him try to re reproduce on my release because we had done so well. And with their resources far greater than mine, greater experience and context than mine, uh, they ended up doing about 25% of my business. <laughs> and because it's not about just getting in the venue, we then put in a crazy amount of work, grunt work, to find our audience. Social media has been huge on our film because we work it incredibly hard. There's, we have about 80 Facebook groups uh, for the film, one for every state, one for every country in Europe as well, that sort of thing. Um, we have a very proactive audience base that, that do a lot to spread the word. We reach out to local media in every single market we play in. Um, you know, for example, last week we had some showings in Ipswich in England, and I had three different radio interviews for it, two with the BBC regionally, um, just for you know one market there. Probably had maybe 500 interviews done for the film. Um, and, you know, all of and we send out extensive outreach emails. We research people who might be interested in the film locally and try to email them all directly. The most we've ever done for a single venue is about 1,400 emails. Um, and how we managed to make that work and is, you know, initially this was just me and I wasn't doing 1,400 emails. But um, when it started to expand, there was a certain point about two and a half years ago Initially, I started doing it in Poland, and then I moved to, to, to Bulgaria, where I've been for almost two and a half years. Um, here, the cost base is such that I can hire in a team and have a lot of these databases. We have insane databases um, that are created to find our audience, to find the venues, reaching that, out to the venues. I'll get, it's crucial we get back to that. Um, but, um, you know, it's cost effective. If I was doing this in LA, New York, London, whatever, with the salaries – and the overheads, I'd be losing a fortune, whereas it's pretty profitable as it is. Uh, but back to the venues. I mean, we start off by, by literally we've emailed every pretty much cinema we can find in the U.S. Um, and a handful get back. It's just that usual kind of, you know, throw it all out there, see who gets back. And then we sort of try to narrow it down. And, and, and it is so funny how hard it can be to convince somebody. Uh, we went to, um, yeah, what was it? about a year and a half to over a year and a half to get our first screening in Wyoming. And we'd been in 
huge numbers of theaters in the surrounding states doing incredibly well in some of them. And finally, one said, okay, yes. And then within eight weeks, we'd been in nine theaters in Wyoming, which prorates to 5,000 nationally because it's a tiny population. Sure. 5,000 nationally. So suddenly, all the other ones in the state are going, wow, this is doing good business. And it's the right timing and blah, blah, blah. So again, it's, it's very regional and it's about tipping points. But theaters are not designed to be contacted for this basis. You'll get movie lines for the most part. Um, but that's it. And a lot of them have very little to do with their own bookings. Um, they go through independent film bookers and there's no real database. You have to scramble around trying to figure out who these people are. It's a really messy system. It's wild, wild west. It's kind of like wild, wild west style. Yeah. Yeah. And they do not care about your film. Nobody's heard of, even though it can do well in theaters, the theaters have to be the ones that ask it, ask them for it. Um, and so that's what we found. Typically you go to those, um, theater owners and then go back the way through the bookers. Um, because they're the ones that go, actually, I can see why this is going to work for my, my audience. And the funny thing is art house cinemas are the least friendly. (laughs) It's true. This is insane with the exceptions of amazing ones like the Kiggins in Washington, whatever, who have been our biggest friends. Um, for the most part, so many, uh, you know, like I even met the head of Art House Convergence in Bucharest. We had a great conversation about the film, and yet he never follows up. Um, this is the perfect success story for their chain of cinemas that could have totally transformed the life of this film. But it's been multiplexes and uh, small town commercial cinemas that are being our friends. And you were telling me also that you you do museums, you do other areas. What are the other areas that you or other venues that you do? Yeah, we we expanded into that in a big way last year um, because it, we were just getting exhausted for the number. I mean, there's some states where we're really running out of theaters, conventional <laughs> cinemas first to place. I mean, seriously, it's it's that crazy in some areas. Um, and then you occasionally get one. I mean, there was one in Washington where they booked us over two years after I first spoke to them. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, some it's just patience, but um, – but it was, you know, for example, uh, just over a year ago, we had five afternoon showings at a museum in Rapid City, and we grossed about four thousand three hundred dollars. And that weekend, there were something like two or three Hollywood releases that had a screen average higher than that throughout the U.S. And you have to bear in mind that a film in Rapid City, on average, would probably have a gross that's around a third of the national average because mm-hmm. of lower ticket price, lower turnouts, and so. I mean, there's probably not a film from the full weekend or possibly full week in Rapid City that week that did what we did in these five afternoons in this museum. And, um, you know, we've had others where, you know, we had a one off and it's grossed 3,300 bucks from a single show. We had one in Aspen like that. Um, and then, you know, and, and others where, you know, we do direct deals with them where, you know, sometimes they just do direct buyouts with us. And, um, that means that they'll know, just buy, they'll just like buy a right, the yeah, right, or you lease it basically to them or you license well, it's it. To basic, them. It's basically where they'll just go, okay, we're going to do a screening for our community and we won't charge them. And, you know, we typically charge, you know, it's typically works at about at five bucks a head to us, which is great, you know. And we've had ones where, you know, probably our best one was maybe I discounted a little bit, but, you know, maybe for 600 people for one showing. And you're suddenly going, well, I'm I'm getting more back from that one showing than I've gotten back from a lot of full run cinemas. Once you break it down, how many years have you been doing this? Over three years on in theatrical. Jesus, so you're doing this now. Three. It's a business now. This is basically oh, a, a full time business. I have, I have I have six employees. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. So I, I, I want, but I want people to li- listening to understand. Like you are the quintessential film entrepreneur. You you are an entrepreneurial filmmaker. You understood that you have a very unique product, which mm-hmm. many filmmakers I've spoken to would have just thrown it up on mm-hmm. on uh, Amazon and iTunes or gone through an aggregator or worse, just given it or just basically donated it to a distributor who would have mm-hmm. no idea what to do with it, and it would just be thrown up there and forgotten and never seen again. But yep. you took this, this no pun intended, bull by the horns uh, mm-hmm. and kind of just really um, built a business around it, you know, and I'm, yep. I'm sure you've already 
easily have taken it past by your budget and you're in profit and you're supporting six salaries plus yourself at the, is this like the major thing that's like running your, your life as far as financial? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, I, I mean, it, it's, it's taken in a good income. Now mm-hmm. the thing that has to contextualize that it, it's been nine years of my life. Sure. So it needs to, it needs to bring in a substantial sum of money at the end of the day to justify the nine years financially. Um, now, the good thing is I can live on very little, and I live in Bulgaria, which helps. You, a stunning place to live, but it's very inexpensive. But it also means that now I have the infrastructure. Now, the thing about it is people go, you're insane spending that amount of time on that. Why don't you just go make your next film? Well, as we all know, going to make your next film is spending X number of years trying to raise finance unless you're lucky and whatever else. Um, I plan to shoot my next film the moment I'm happy with the script and I'm happy with the cast because there's a decent income that's come in that I have not spent. So it is amassing. But the other thing is I have this theatrical distribution set up. I have now done theatrical distribution in four countries so far. So we've also done Canada. We've done the UK. We're at about six-day cinemas in the UK. Uh, we also released here in Bulgaria. We did quite nicely. We did probably not far off some big independent films like The Killing of Sacred Deer. And I have now an official distribution company here, so that film, I, I'm going to shoot an international thriller in Bulgaria, but I can immediately get it into Bulgarian cinemas. And there's a reasonable chance we'll make a nice percentage of our, our budget back because I know it's going to appeal to local market and, and some local films can do very, very well here. And, and so I, I instantly have that, that I- infrastructure now. Now, people go, theatrical doesn't make money. Well, it does. You just have to be clever about It'll how work. you go about it. Yeah, and hustle. I mean, and and but the key point for me is before when I said you know forget all the other distributors, there was a a, a light bulb moment, eureka moment for me. Uh, a friend of mine uh, directed a film years ago with Ewan McGregor and Eva Green, and you think two good box office names. It was released by IFC and it grossed two thousand nine hundred dollars in the United States. How is that a thing? How? Exactly. IFC, who are, you know, one of the major independent film distributors, uh, something like 25% of their films gross 15 grand or less. Why? Yeah. I mean, this is the crazy thing. There's, in the, in the three years I've been on release, they have, between IFC and Kino Lorber, who are the two most prolific art house distributors in the U.S., they've released about 140 films, 150 f- well, actually, well, 160 films or so between them. And only, I think, about 12 of IFC films have outgrossed mine, not a single one from Kino Lorber. Jeez. And they're the experts in this, and I've never done this before. That's... And it's just pure graft. And they would have all both turned down this film. Mm-hmm. And they'd have done both done probably 20 grand with it. If you're lucky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you're lucky, if the if the Ewan and the Eva movie only made two grand, I can only imagine. Yeah. Now, I want to also tell your your listeners out there the biggest mistake I've made in this entire release. Uh-huh. And for the longest time, I was thinking, you know, how am I going to get a na- more national presence for this story? You know, the release is so unique, the film is so unique, the cultural importance is so unique because of Dave Bald Eagle and Wounded Knee, and th- this is one of the most important Native American films ever made because of Dave Bald Eagle, our elder, who's in it. Um, and all of these amazing things about the release and how unusual, da, 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 da. And it's like we're getting amazing local media servicing the release very well, but not servicing us in a national media context, not helping us for video on demand or whatever else. And I kept thinking, should I invest in a film publicist that has all these connections? And finally, in September, I four-walled a theater in L.A., in Pasadena. And I contacted a lot of publicists. Almost none of them bothered replying. One of them who I spoke to, we spoke for an hour, and the key thing I stressed the whole time is we can email all of these people. We can email all the film media in the world. They just don't get back to us. So the reason I'm paying, I would be paying you this large amount of money is because you have these connections to pick up the phone and say, hey, what do you think of this story? And that's the basis we work forward on. And as we head towards the release, uh, she sets up uh, a TV interview on KTLA in the morning, and you know, which was a nice piece, wonderful. They did a, actually a very nice job with it. Um, 
but it was nice because the producer was part native and just felt a kinship with the story. So it landed on the right desk. Um, I also did an interview with Variety, got a full page in that the following week after our opening. And uh, other than doing three little online vloggy things that she set up for me that nobody would ever see, that was all the media that I got for my thousands of dollars. And as we sort of do the postmortem on it, I said, so how many of these people did you phone? And she said, well, nobody picks up their phones. <laughs> and I'm like, that is why I was paying you. That is why we had that hour-long conversation. That is the whole point of this. We could be emailing them and all being ignored at the same time, too. Hey. You know, and, and you know, I had this very long and, – and, okay, we got quite a few reviews. But we released it in the UK just doing our own publicity as well, like everything else. In, in LA, we got LA Times, LA Weekly, you know, NPR, all those various ones. In the UK, we got the BBC, The Guardian, yeah. you know, total. Because your film's coming out, they look at it, they go, okay, these are the releases, we review them. How do we get a screener? It's, it's like that's not worthy of spending thousands to get, you know, that's not the hard sell for a, for, for a journalist. Mm. It is literally the biggest waste of money in my entire career. It's uh-huh. the single the biggest feeling. financial, yeah, the single biggest financial mistake I've made in this whole process. Now, perhaps as probably some other publicists there who would have far greater integrity to say, well, I'm not going to be, you know, I will be making all those calls or I will not be making those calls. But if you want me to, if you're paying me to make those calls and I'm not making those calls, I'm not going to take your money, you know? And so it, you know, simply put, if I put those thousands into Facebook ads. Yeah, you would have gotten better. I would have done far better, far better. I mean, as it stood, we were the eighth high screen average in the U.S. that week. You know, we did fine. Mm-hmm. Our, our so that was so average, was so was a positive experience in, in Pasadena. No, I mean it was it was if if I had no publicist, I'd have walked away reasonably happy. You know, I'd have washed our face almost with it. It's the publicist that was the flushing the to- the money down the toilet, and that. Is, I'm going to be furious about that for the longest time. Oh, I know and, the feeling, uh, brother. I had the same experience yeah. with with uh, a publicist in my book, my one of my first my first book. Mm-hmm. It's it, it just it was such a waste, such a waste. I could do much more myself um, mm-hmm. and reach out to people myself. So, uh, and that's something I, I realized that publicists are not. You know, maybe when you're at the very highest levels and you got these publicists are being paid twenty grand a month. Um, that they could literally pick you up and like, you're going to go on entertainment tonight. You're going to go on CBS. You're going to go on 60 minutes, you know, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe, but even mm-hmm. then it, the ROI is just not there. It, it just, yeah. not, it's just not there. And that's for this kind of scenario that you're putting out. So, I, so I wanted to just kind of, you know, wrap it up with, you know, you, you've basically created a film for a niche audience, which is a, a specific kind of audience who want, obviously fans of the book. Fans of 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 Native American stories. You've then put that film in markets and areas where your audience lives, or you can cultivate relationships with that audience. And you have built a business around it for the past three years, doing solely theatrical uh, and, mm-hmm. and public screenings. Is that a fair? Essentially, yes. I mean, we we have the capacity for you know DVD. We have a sort of import model. We haven't. We're not selling it within the U.S., but people can buy it and import it. We have this model where we have a a warehouse in China where they do our shipping. The shipping from China to the U.S. is as cheap as, or actually cheaper than U.S. to U.S. But it also means we can ship the entire world for the same price instead of charging people fourteen dollars in Europe to get it shipped from the U.S. or whatever else. The manufacturing's cheaper. Everything's cheaper. Um, but it's also our, you know, it it still keeps the U.S. pristine in terms of theater, theatrical only, you know, as a as a pure concept, if you like. Um, and the DVD sales are healthy; they're 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 quite nice. So you and are selling you are end, selling DVDs. So that is another revenue stream that you've created. Yeah, for yourself. but it's but it, I mean it's at a theoretically a boutique level. But where our average sale per store visit, I think, is probably about thirty five bucks. Okay. And so really you know, good. that's really good. Yeah, it's really yeah. good. Yeah. So, so and 
So we don't need to sell a lot to do quite nicely. So when uh, do you have a plan to stop this crazy train? Uh, you know, when and you did another five years, another two years. I mean, how long, much longer are you going to keep it in theatrical? Or are you ever going to go to on demand if you even want to? Does it make sense to? Well, the, the, the thing about it is the thing I found is I want to be setting up this business. So we're dealing with all these companies directly and I don't want intermediaries taking money yes. just for the sake of it. And, and I've had some a, a while ago approach us about that. Um, so for me, it's like getting to the point where they can ignore us. They can't ignore us any longer. I mean, my, my position is quite simple on this. I don't for a second believe as well as I've done with this film. I don't for a second believe that a really big hitting distributor who knows what they're doing. I mean, I, I mean an imaginative one like the way the Weinsteins or the Miramax before them were where they could take something and market the hell out of it that they couldn't do at least 10 times the admissions that I've done with this film with zero experience with I mean I I spent less than a grand as my outlay at the beginning of of distribution um now if if they had 10 times the admissions as I had on this film that would be a million admissions in theaters which would on an average ticket price put us maybe up at eight and a half million as a gross domestically which puts us really hitting the higher echelon of what um, you know, independent films are doing. I mean, that's, you know, um, where as it stands, we've outperformed, you know, like I, Daniel Blake, Palm Door winner, we've done four times the admissions of that, which is just shows how desperate the U.S. market is. I mean, it was making f- millions in France, millions in the U.K. and that sort of thing. And in the U.S., it's doing like, I don't know, 250 grand or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's this, the secondary platforms. The thing I always have is, we don't get media for being in all those other things. And the more we're, you know, the more media coverage that we get, the more we build for all those other market streams. And, you know, I can be in this in for the long haul. The film has to get to a point of, of having a cultural existence. And it's something where people see it as communities is very important. And, you know, also in terms of when it gets a hold in, I mean, even with the DVD sales that we get, um, I see the towns we've already played in heavily in those places and not a lot to the regions we haven't played in yet. So there's definitely a huge benefit. Um, but, you know, the other thing is that I'm very loyal to my team because they've been very, very loyal to me. And so it's also a case of while we're profitable, I want to keep this going as well. So, you know, they're in those positions long enough, hopefully, before I put the next thing in the pipeline. But also I'm open to potentially doing service deals for other distributors going into self distribution, whether it's picking up part of part of it. Um, one of the things we've done that saved money a lot has been dealing with our own DCPs. Um, in the UK I've taken a lot further where I, I do a lot of theaters having, having a lot of theaters downloaded directly from my own cloud. Mm-hmm. So there's zero delivery fees. Um, that doesn't really wash in the U S particularly, but we, we do our own, you know, crew hard drives, we do our own formatting and everything else. And yeah. we've, we, we've, you know, we've saved a lot that way. There's a lot of things that we can do for other people, especially on the database gathering, the, the, the local media, things like that. Apart from anything else, because we've got a, we started to build a lot of connections. So you, um, you've created this infrastructure. You've created this basically yeah. indie film self distribution in, infrastructure that yeah. you could plug in other films into that Definitely. infrastructure. And, Definitely. And you, I mean, to be honest, what fits best is if we if we find similar um, films of, of of sort of meaning to communities, um, you know, other Native American subject films would work well for us. But and and I, you know, the funny thing is with a lot of places we've played in, um, it's it's a little bit like the faith based market, which kind of is not where I would normally go with anything, shall we sure. say? But it's a similar way to how they market it. You know, they, they, they know where they're, I mean, we reach out a lot to churches because, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of under, you know, journey to understanding and so on and so on with our narrative. So, um, and these are groups that are easy to find. And, um, uh, but it, again, it's sort of that thing where if somebody had a skateboard movie and they said, you know, we want you to find every skater community within the United States, it's gonna be rough. Yeah, we got our we got our we, we got our team on it. I mean, the thing is that our our cost base is here is such that we can explore that. 
you know, we've got already got a database of essentially the emails for every library in the United States. Um, pretty much every college, uh, every cinema, pretty much every small town theater. We're talking about tens of thousands of email addresses and contacts for these things. Um, and this is the thing we're, we're, we're picking up a lot of these small town theaters that have the ability to project. They're, they do a lot of other things, but you know they can project. Would you and, would you take a film that's already available online, even if it's culturally, or it has to be a theatrical window? It just has to be relevant to the venue. And okay. you know, for example, we you know, for example, this week we have back we're back in the same museum in in Rapid City, and we're having four films showing there over nine days, rotating, and three of them are three features I made on that reservation. And one of them's a, a film elsewhere, a, a sort of mockumentary comedy, Native American comedy called More Than Fry Bread. And it came out many years ago, but it never played there as my two feature, other features hadn't. And it sort of fit nicely in that strand together. Um, it's just it, things really have to make sense to the venues. Um, okay. You know, and, and it's interesting that there's, there's um, some guy, what's his name, Warren, uh, who's been doing these uh, ski films for, I think, 30 years or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting when you see that he's created an a extraordinary distribution network of, of venues, both cinemas, halls, other kinds of places that are now plugged into this kind of thing. And it's, it was a model being created years before Fathom. Right. But it's a similar sort of concept. The other thing I would say, which is important, is a lot of people will look at these uh, audience uh, f- sort of crowd, uh, you know, the 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 um, crowdfunding tugs. The, no, no. The, you know, the tugs and the you know, the tug just went under, right? Oh, really? Yeah, tug That's- literally just went bankrupt and screwed thousands of filmmakers. I just I just broke the story a little while ago. Oh, really? That doesn't <laughs> surprise me at all. Yeah. Um, you know, and gather changed their business model. It right and you know they're I mean, expensive. I, I, and they're there's expensive. another one out of this. Well, yeah, there's another one I dealt with out of Australia. There's so apart from anything else, they've been a, a, all of them have been really problematic to deal with. You know, we've had maybe five, six, seven thousand showings or something in the United States, and I started off doing some stuff with Tug and then walked away. Uh, Try to switch to the other two, and they just were so pointless to deal with. And it's such a travesty. Because done right, it's the future. Yeah. And they've just all totally blown it because they've just, A, they just made themselves difficult to deal with. Uh, but also just in terms of the pricing points. And the theaters sound, I mean, the, the theaters are asking for way too much. You know, I mean, to be honest, if, if you're talking about a theater in, you know, a small town in, in, you know, Minnesota, they should be happy to get 200 bucks for that one showing on a Tuesday night and, and getting a few people buying sodas and top popcorn. Cause they're doing better out of that than anything else they're playing that night. Correct. Pretty much. Correct. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a, yeah. Win, so it should so be a win-win. Exactly. And, and so, you know, hopefully that'll, that'll sort itself out. But, and yeah. do you think, what do you think the future is? Do you think, because people are going to theaters less and less. And I feel that, that there is, a, I think personally that there is, a lot of potential for independent films in the theatrical environment because there's only so many movies the studios are putting out every year. There are. I, I think the future is amazing, and it, and it's it's just ripe for somebody to set up a different model. Now, there's um, I'm trying to remember the name of the model, um, uh, Prolodio, mm-hmm. uh, a, a sort of delivery system out of. Um, um, the living room theaters people set up. Now they were trying to do a thing where just theaters can pull a film uh, off this platform, get you know bypass DCPs, so that you could get secondary venues doing things in a in a in a more straightforward system. Even then, it's too much proprietary stuff. There needs to be a sort of open source solution where it still films are are protected, uh, but where they're being pulled onto the systems at no cost, where. Um, you know, the theaters just basically do a poll saying, here's 10 trailers. Uh, which one do you want to see the most of three weeks on a Tuesday night? Um, and, you know, we'll pick what, whatever one you vote for and it'll be there. And there's just zero cost getting it there. It's And, and the VPS system, VPF system is a nightmare. VPF companies are nightmares. Uh, they're just pains in the behinds. 
uh, they don't even understand their own contracts. That's one of them, particularly one of them, which is the most disturbing part. Um, and um, but you know that we will move beyond um, as the technology price points come down. Uh, there will be more secondary venues as well. Um, and it is this thing where it'll be more like some of the art, you know, in Europe, you have a lot of art cinemas where they'll have a, a really curated selection. So, you know, in, it'll be four, four different films on the same screen, uh, sometimes each day and they can afford to do it because they've got a lot of subsidies. Mm -hmm. It's very much a, a public service, but the reason they need that subsidy is because, the whole print process and whatever was always so expensive, even with DCPs. Uh, whereas once we get to that technology point where there's zero cost involved with that, where even there's, I mean, I don't even know why right now, why we're still dealing with posters, why every uh, venue doesn't just have a, an Digital. electronic LCD screen. Yeah. I mean, it's just from an environmental standpoint overall, uh, when you add, add it up over, over everything. Um, and you know they're, we're in the 21st century, and and the film business just is is way behind catching up. And then their their financial model will be much better. Um, now, you know, a lot of people like my mother's generation were never going to the theater much 20 years ago, 30 years ago. They're going much more now because it's a night out, even though they have the Netflixes and whatever else. And so for them, it's really about. The desire, you know, oh, here's something we want to see, and they, and when it's on, they go. It's not like, what are we going to Friday night? What are we going to Saturday night? The young audience that are that way inclined, or have been pandered to too much, and and it needs to be a case. Of, I mean, my, I work well for cinemas with my movie because, um, it's got a much older audience, and they go to see it when it's on. Like in Nottingham in England, we had something like 135 people going to see it on a, Tuesday, on a Thursday afternoon. And, you know, all old people pretty much. Um, because it was something that appealed to them. Now, on a Friday or Saturday night, we don't typically do as well. And, you know, so again, there's a variety of films that do well. You know, like, you know, in history's terms, is anything done better at midnight than Rocky Horror? You know, or or the way the room has worked right. for that, and you know, there's a lot of other venues that would. I mean, the room probably would never have had that life back in the day of the mall needing a 35 mil print, right? Because it would, it could never have had that tipping point. Uh, whereas Rocky Horror did because the prints existed, and um, whereas now, you know, there is that great scope for, you know, let's put on the monkey's movie head at midnight on a Saturday night and then follow with a hard day's night as a double bill because we can just pull these off this service and it's not going to, co going to cost us nothing. And even if they walk away with a hundred bucks from it, we're all winning. Right. So there is, there is, a, I think there's an amazing future. It just needs to walk into the tech age. I personally think, and, and this isn't something that is a good thing, but if Facebook wanted to get into the theatrical oh, realm, they could take it over in two years. Because of their because their access to audience, it's not a bad they idea. Could, they could literally go. We know exactly what they want to see. We know exactly how to get to them. So everyone who is going to like the room or is going to like a rerun of the Sound of Music or whatever else, and and they can just market straight to them. And you know they're winning because it's their own advertising spend to themselves. You know, and and it's almost like looking at it the way that that you know Netflix. You know when they're advertising through their own platform. Or through their own email list, there's zero cost to them, um, and you know. So the amount of data they have on on our habits and and that sort of thing, and then they could take it secondary as well. That you you just play the movies through your you know a different part of your Facebook account. That, you know, um, they could have an unbelievable dominance incredibly fast. Very interesting. Well, uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions to ask all of my guests. Uh, what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? If you ever have a second's doubt about it, <laughs> don't. Get the hell out. Do anything. Go get, if there's literally anything else a second's do. doubt, don't do it because you're not strong enough. Fair enough. Is that true? Oh, and a hundred and ten percent. It's hundred and ten percent. No question. I've never had a second. I've been in this a long time, sadly. Now, 
I have <laughs> sadly ever. <now. laughs> I've, I've, you know, I've had a lot of doubt about other things. You know, should I have that cheesecake or not? But never ever about making films. It's not because I love it. It's just it's who I am. It's a hundred percent of who I am. No, you were bitten by that bug, and it's a virus, and you can't get rid of it. It just you know it flares up sometimes. It goes dormant sometimes, but it's always there, and it, it can never get rid of it, no matter how much mm-hmm. you try. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Um, I don't know about the longest per se, but I think the most important life lesson, and this goes for everything, this goes for creative and whatever else, is never judge something as a good or a bad thing until it's played itself out. <laughs> and I learned that quite a few years ago. And and as a slight anecdote, I had this occasion um, quite a few years ago where this lady who had been in my life not so long before came out of the blue and told me I had a one-year-old child with her. And I didn't panic. And I thought, well, this is curious. In 20 years' time, this relationship with this child might be the most beautiful, best thing that ever happened to me. Or it might be 20 years dealing with this crazy mother or whatever else. As it turned out, it took me a while to find out, she invented the whole thing. And so it just turned out to be a great story for moments like today. Um, <laughs> But the point was I never freaked out because I had no idea how it was going to play itself out. And there was a moment when I had uh, about a half million dollars on the table uh, for this film from a tribe. And it was great. And we were negotiating with our lawyers and all these other things. And they were big fans of the novel and whatever. And a friend of mine, old friend of mine in Hollywood said, why are you not more excited about this? And I'm like, well, We'll see. Yeah, we'll see how it plays you out. You know, this is a film business. <laughs> and, then, and then a year went by and a lot of different things changed and problems on their end and problems I had to deal with and whatever. And the whole th- then the finance collapsed. And he said, why are you not more upset? <laughs> and I'm like, well. <laughs> I didn't really get invested. <laughs> you know, you, you just, you know, let's see how it plays itself out. Good advice. Um, so, you know, but then – it's hard not to take a lot of things personally in this business as well. I mean, I'd, I'd like to be, I'd like to be Zen about it, but you know, I'd, I'd say to other people, don't hold grudges, but I'd like to take my own, gru- <laughs> my own advice. You know? I mean, obviously that publicist still bothers you. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Um, well, I always say seven samurai just because it's perfect. It is. And, uh, just for the hell of it, because uh, my mind's going there, my favorite comedy is Love and Death by Woody Allen. Yeah, yeah, I remember that one. That's a good one. Uh, it, it's about the only film I could watch back to back. Um, and, um, gosh, I'll say, um, oh, I'll, I'll speak for, I'll speak for my, my teenage self, uh, I would say I'll, I'll speak for my teenage self for picking up the camera for the first time. Enter the Dragon and the entire eighties works of Jackie Chan. Oh, he's such a genius! He's such a genius, absolute genius. Not not just a genius though. It's like the hardest working, oh, you know, ever. person you can imagine ever. Yeah, and yeah. you know, from a kid. I mean, I don't know if you ever saw Painted Faces. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I was like, that he's, was a hell of a childhood. He's no, he's got a he's got a very interesting life, to say the least. Very interesting yeah. life. A lot of people first saw him in um, Rush Hour. I'm like, no, no, he's been oh, yeah. <laughs> he's been he's been doing this a little bit longer. I, it was funny. I when I first lived in L.A., uh, the famous new art cinema, yeah, uh, had a two week festival of Hong Kong movies. Uh, double bills, two to, two days each, and it was heaven. And they were packed, and I've never been in an audiences that laughed and cheered and applauded as much ever. It was like a, a Project A2 and uh, Armor of God 2 double bill. I mean, right. just extraordinary. And I guarantee you Tarantino will have been in the audience for most of those times I was there. I saw everyone too. And and there's no way he didn't see every single film there. And, and it was when Hollywood dis- discovered – um, Hong Kong. What, what many of us already knew, right. uh, but seeing it on the big screen like that was a revelation to us. So I'd seen every one of them I, before. I still, I still remember going to see in the theater Hard Boiled because I saw a poster. This was like ninety, ninety two, two ninety two, ninety three. It was right around mm-hmm. a mariachi time, 
And I remember going to the theater and there was a poster with a dude with a shotgun holding a baby in a diaper. And I was just like, I need to see this movie. And I was just like, <laughs> what is going on? And I just mm. was blown, blown away. Um, and where can people find you and what you're doing and your work? Well, uh, the film, you know, I have Facebook pages for my film, for myself, for everything else that I've done. Uh, join the conversation there. Or, you know, stephenlewissimpson.com. I post a little bit. I need to get, start doing more with it. One of the things I'm actually going to do in the next few months is I'm going to be creating – um, what I would imagine will be the most in-depth uh, micro-budget film masterclass that's ever been because – and I say this as an insane person who makes a film with a crew of two that ends up being in six, 700 venues sure. between a few different countries um, that will be detailing everything from – uh, and 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 it, it it's I mean the stuff I've done is beyond that it's been insane from you know I've prosecuting my own arbit- arbitration hearings against international sales agent or auditing them and various things like that or doing your own you know deals with foreign broadcasters or you know there's there's a lot of different sides of things or how to structure auditions in a way that that will maybe do more to persuade an actor to come on to something that might be a little smaller than they normally do or there's you know so many little tidbits along the way as well as so in depth about the distribution and mm-hmm, every stage mm-hmm. of that and buying and selling the equipment, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, because it, you know, I do everything in house. I mean, the, the, the literally from, I did hundred percent of the pre-production myself and a hundred percent of post-production, including DVD authoring, Blu-ray authoring, DCP authoring, yeah, DCP yeah. delivery, all those kinds of things. And, and we are in that world now. And, um, you know, now I'm in the position where I can just train my team up to take care of those things, which is great. But, um, you know, I think it's crucial for all of us to, you know, there, there was something very, uh, influential when I was growing up. Uh, there was a book Eli Kazan did about relating to directing Mm -hmm. and there was this bit towards the end and it was like, here's what you have to learn to be a director. And it was like, each subject was like a paragraph and it was page after page after page from, you know, understanding, you know, 15th century costume, if that's the kind of thing you're doing or to understand. I mean, it was literally the minutia of the minutia of so many of whatever, you know. Um, and, you know, like over the weekend, I was blowing up a private jet in my new script and I'm like learning things about jets, you know. And and it, it is that incredible thing about what we do. Stephen, then thank you so much for the inspiration, telling us uh, the story, and hopefully giving some hope to filmmakers out there because it is pretty rough in the distribution space nowadays. And to give them some sort of hope. Uh, and what I love about your story is that it works, but there's a lot of work to get it to work. Uh, yeah. It's not going to be like, oh, I just uploaded and collect checks. It's that's generally not the way it works. And uh, my experience dealing with filmmakers is a lot of times they just you know they just want to work on the movie and not worry about how the money's made, uh, but they don't want to put all that work that you've obviously been able to put into it. Yeah, one thing about the distribution, there's a very interesting study that the Sundance Institute did on the release of Columbus that they gave some grant money towards, and it's very interesting. A lot of your viewers will learn quite a bit from it. What I also learned from it was that the booker, the experienced booker that they had was negotiating lower end deals than I've been negotiating. I had the same in the UK. I started off with a a specialist guy who was getting nowhere. And he was always trying to go in for 35% in the UK. The percentages in the UK are lower. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas I keep pushing them up there and I've only, I think, done maybe one 35% deal in the UK. I've got quite a few 50% deals, 45s and whatever. Uh, whereas in the U.S., it's almost entirely been 50%. Whereas they were averaging with Columbus around maybe 36, 37% or something. And their outlay was far, far greater than mine. So we've done about the same number of admissions. Their gross was quite a bit higher because they're playing in main cities with much, much greater ticket prices. Um, plus, I've got a lot of older people coming to see it and they pay less. Um, but I've been far more profitable far more profitable. And, and so it is sort of that thing about what, what again, through the master class, it's, it's, it's literally how to, you know, I mean, make money, make a profit out of your poster budget because you're selling them to your fans as well. 
Stop it. Stop it. Make money with your film. You're talking crazy talk, sir. <laughs> crazy talk, you're saying. Steve, thank you so much, Stephen. I appreciate your time, brother. I know, pretty insane. I, I didn't think it was possible either, but this is why I have the show, because I'm able to bring you success stories and case studies of successful filmmakers doing their own thing, thinking outside the box, being film entrepreneurs, and really changing the paradigm of distribution for the indie filmmaker. If you want to get links to anything we discussed in this episode, including watching his TED Talk and also taking a look at Stephen's new masterclass that he has a Kickstarter for, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 390. And guys, if you haven't already checked out my free three-part low-budget indie producing video series that is taught by the best-selling author and veteran film producer Suzanne Lyons, go to IndieFilmHacks.com and sign up and get three videos sent directly to your email with about an hour worth of content that will help you produce your next independent film. That's IndieFilmHacks.com. Dot com. Thanks for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.